prayer and praise. I, I'm from, I was born and raised in North Alabama, a little town called Tuscumbia, up on a place called Wheeler Mountain. One of the things that we're very familiar with in that area is the Tennessee River actually runs east to west, and it runs into the Mississippi that runs north to south. That, that river is so huge. It's so big. I'm talking 100-pound catfish up by the dam. Uh, there's several dams there. It's, it's so deep, and the banks are so high. That's what's amazing right now is there's actually flooding. Uh, the last two weeks, they've been flooding in that area on the lower side. But banks are so important because without banks, you can't control the water. You can't control the channel. And knowing that, uh, I know the difference in a river and a creek. When I first got to San Antonio, I went to college in San Antonio, people were telling me, go downtown and look at the San Antonio River. There are places I can jump across that river, at least when I was a little younger, ain't much wider than this aisleway here. And I'm going to tell you, that is no river. Where I'm from, that's a creek, and it ain't even a good creek. You know, I mean, the rivers I've seen have been something else. They stand the test of time. You know, creeks can often bust out easy, but not, not rivers. They, they're deep. Psalms 46, verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Revelation 22, 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Uh, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. The reason I mention these is, is that heaven itself will be like a river, and so is the church. The church is to be like a river. It should be something not just flowing in, but also flowing out. If it's only flowing in, we're in trouble. We get stagnant, but flowing out is very important. So I call these two banks. One is a bank of prayer. Amen. That bank there, it's got to be built up. Uh, Pastor Gary was very good this week talking about prayer. Prayer has to do with personal relationship with Christ that flows from being forgiven. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Now, we're all guilty. We're all guilty of not first taking our request to God. We've tried to, try to figure out any other way to make something happen or make it work in our own power, and, and it, we're guilty of it. So what's important is, is take this again and realize anxious means worry. Again, you can't add hair to your head or you can't add length to your life. You can't add inches to your height by worrying. You can take hair from your head. You can lose length of life and you can get shorter by worrying. Maybe not the shorter, but the mother two parts. I know you can. Earl said, yeah, you can. Amen. So there you go. Be careful with it. Uh, the balance of the banks, again, did not be anxious about anything. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Catch this, that there's a peace that when everybody says you ought to be troubled, you ought to be down, because you know him and because you know his track record and the fact that he's got you through this before, he's going to get you through it again. And peace starts overwhelming you. You can't explain it to other people. It passes understanding. They can't figure this out. But God is doing something amazing in your life. Amen. The balance, again, public relationship with Jesus, it affects many people. Keep rolling, sir. Balance, Second Chronicles 714. If my people. It's a, it, there's a stipulation here. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He didn't say if the enemy will repent and turn. He said if my people, those who call me their God, their Savior, if my people will repent, turn around, quit doing, go back to the penthouse, get back to the top. If my people would do this, I'm telling you what I will do. Uh, and they'll seek my face turn from their wicked ways, then will I, they hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. I'm starting to walk through Scripture and realize over and over again that land, geography, has, that heaven has a lot to do with geography, that God decides if a land will be healed or not. It has to do with the, with the people. And many of us say, well, no, God's too good. I'm telling you, Hosea even lays out, no, Haggai lays out a thought that if you don't take care of the house of God, then, how, then I'm not going to take care of your house. In other words, you've been looking after something else instead of taking care of my house. So God has this way of looking down and seeing what we're doing here. He says, if you'll repent and turn, America's only hope is this scripture. It's our only hope is that we repent and turn and watch and see what God does. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Balance of the bank. How to build up the bank of prayer? Communion. 
Have communion with God. Amen. It means to a desire to enter into a relationship, an intimate relationship with him. Communion, common union. What do you have in common with God? I know you'd say, not much. Oh, you do. First, God put creative power in you. He gave you a tongue. He gave you arms. He gave you legs. We're creating his image. So we do have things that are in common. So we enter into communion with him. Adoration literally means to kiss the hand. Do you adore him? I know that sounds almost to feminine for some men to say but do you adore him do you just look at what christ has done in your life and say that's amazing what he did how he walked what all the things that he accomplished while he's here and what he still does over and over again man there are times that that god is uh is tender and there's other times that he will slap you off your horse as somebody say your high horse like he did Saul, when he knocked him down and he blinded him, and, and, and Saul said, who, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. That's who I am. And he's there and he's blind. There, there are times God will put you in a fix to fix you. Amen. He loves you that much. Adoration, confession of guilty disobedience. You confess. You say, well, God already knows. Yeah, but he needs to hear it from you. He needs to hear your confession. Now, again, we don't confess to one another our sins. We confess our faults, but not our sins. You may confess your sins to God, your shortcomings, the places that you missed the mark. And then intercession on behalf of leaders and neighbors. Have you ever got into a place where you woke up early? I woke up 5 o'clock. Yeah, I know some of you to say, that's not early. It is to me. 5 o'clock I woke up, I was wide awake. Whenever God wakes me up early and I know that it's God that done it, I start praying for people. I ask him to put people. And you know what he does? This is what's crazy. He always puts people in my life that don't like me. And normally, I'm not supposed to like them either, but I'll pray for them. And then often, I don't know, is this arrogant? I'll send them a text and say, I prayed for you today. You know, I, I really wasn't my good doings. It was God. I don't put that part. But, but, I, but I, I find myself, Jesus even talks, pray for your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you and they, they don't like you. You've got to pray for them. So when I look at this and I realize that intercession on behalf Pray for one another. Pray for the leaders of this church. Pray for the, uh, those around you. Pray for your, your spouses. Pray for your children. Amen. Again, that, that has to do with turning from our wicked ways. I, I've, I've looked at this and realized this is, this is what you see Israel going through over and over again, and it happens in our own life. First, they got rebellious. After they got rebellious, there was retribution. God spanked them. You see it over and over. He would use the Philistines, Philistines to spank them. He would use... Uh, 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 um, drought, all kind of things to straighten them out. They would just re rebel, get mad. And then Moses would have to get water out of the rock and things like that. So they'd rebel. There'd be retribution. Then there'd be repentance. You really see this in, that, in the Bible when you realize how much Israel went through 400 years in Egypt, 70 years in Babylon. They, they were always getting in trouble. Then they'd repent and cry out to God, rescue us. God would restore them. He would give them back their nation, their leadership, judges and kings, and things would be good. And then what would happen? Go back, go back, 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 back. Then they'd rebel again. And in our own life, when we're not careful, we walk through this cycle. We rebel against God. Just, oh, I see our kids at youth camp, man. They get on fire for God. They're excited for Jesus. Everything's wonderful. They go to retreats. Things happen. And the next thing you know, they, they, they get rebellious. They get mad. They get upset. This didn't work out. Mama did that. Daddy did this. Youth pastor didn't call me. Amen. This thing happened there. Then, then they get rebellious. And then all of a sudden, they get in trouble again. Retribution comes. They get spanked by, by the Heavenly Father. And they realize, man, this this is stupid. This is wrong. I've got myself in trouble again. They repent toward God. By that time, it's another youth camp or a revival or so, or maybe a personal revival. Just something that happens within them. They repent, and then God brings restoration in their life. Things are great and wonderful. It's hard for us just to stay in it in just a place of balance, to stay at it for so long. Amen. We find ourselves going back into these cycles. So it's important to intercede, to keep praying for one another. Nineveh was a nation that forgot. Nineveh, God sent a prophet, Jonah, in the belly of a well to Nineveh. That wasn't the uh, original mode of transportation. It was supposed to have been a boat. Instead, he went the other way. The boat started getting tossed back and forth. They threw Jonah out of the boat. Sometimes it ain't, it ain't your house that's the trouble. It's something that's in your house. Amen. Throw Jonah from the boat. 
They threw him overboard. Fish swallows him. Boats calm. Men are good. Boat heads. Fish heads back to Nineveh. Spits him out on dry ground. He's got seaweed wrapped around his head. He's, he's sloshing in his boots. He's got acid washed jeans on. You know, the scripture says actually that Jonah prayed in the belly of the well. He repented. He's, oh God, he was sorry. He knew he was a prophet. And prophets were to go where God says go, do what God says do when God says do it. He had it on a card, had it in his billfold. He forgot. And he went the other direction. And in the other direction, he's in trouble now. And, and so he, he gets in the belly of the well. Do you, you have any idea how dark that is? I know you're thinking the well has a skyline, but it ain't always open. Uh, it, 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 it's dark in there. It's smelly. The death of dead squid and fish and algae. and You're not there for a day. You're not there for 48 hours. You're in there for 71 hours and 55 minutes. And if you look at the book of Jonah, it takes less than five minutes to pray his prayer. His prayer was simply this. Forgive me. I've done wrong. I'll go where you say go. Do what you say do when you say do it. At that, the well threw him up on ground. I honestly believe that Jonah knew he was coming out of that well, either front or back. <laughs> and he decided, I'm going to go front. And when that well threw him up on the land, he goes into Nineveh and he says, in 40 days, God's going to kill all of y'all. Hallelujah. He didn't like the Ninevites. He didn't like the Assyrians. He knew they were wicked. They were mean toward his people. He didn't want to see them repent. God help us. Some of us have people we know. We pray to God they go to hell. That's wrong. Shouldn't pray that way. Should pray God takes them, saves them. Amen. We're able to handle it. But, but he didn't like them. He ne- and you can't find in your Bible where he ever told the people to repent. He never said to them. He said in 40 days, God's going to kill every one of y'all. Thank you, Jesus. And the Bible says they took one look at him and repented. If God's going to do that to one of his prophets, imagine what he'll do to us. So they all began to repent. They fasted. They, they were in rebellion. They turned toward God. They repented. And at that time, if you, if you study it all out, they began to forget 160 years later. Matter of fact, over a million people are saved during the repentance. 160 years later, the book of Nahum, chapter 3, verse 1, records, Woe to the bloody city Nineveh. In other words, his justice cannot sleep forever. And America isn't big enough to shake her fist in the face of an angry God. We're not, we're not so much that we're not like Sodom and Gomorrah and Nineveh ourselves, that we have to turn back to him. So then there is restoration. Forgive their sins. Again, factual, full, and forever. That's how he forgives us. So we build up the bank of prayer. Next, the bank of praise. I love praise. I love praise. I love getting loud. I love shouting on the team. I love getting involved with, 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 with uh, the emotion of all of it. I like lifting my hands. You know, I do that at football games, basketball games. When my kids are out there, run, run. It's a breakaway. I just remember yelling for my kids. And I get to church. And Jesus has done great things for us. Who's healed us, forgiven us, loves us, gave us great friends and family. We come to church. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I mean, all through Scripture, God's telling them, march around Jericho seven times. On the last day, seventh day, march uh, seven more times around. March six times around on the seventh day, march six times around, 13 times around. March, and when you get there, shout! And they got the Ark of the Covenant with them. They got the presence of God. Don't tell me that when David comes into the city, he's dancing. Old Testament's full of worship. It's full of adoration. It's full of excitement. Praise, my friend, is such a powerful. And I know it's hard for some of us to kind of lift our hands, open our mouth. But if you can just remember everything God's done for you and forget those that are around you, I promise you, you're going to be able to praise him. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Why is it? Because we, we're made to praise We're made to do this. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp, the lyre. Praise Him with the tambourine dancing. Praise Him with the strings and the flute. If you understand the scripture, all He's really trying to say is whatever you got, praise Him with it. Praise Him with whatever you have. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals, resounding cymbals. Let everything that hath, that hath, everybody breathe. Let me hear you again one more time. 
One more time. So if you have, you're to praise him. When you no longer have, you can quit. But as long as you got, you praise him. That's the only stipulation you got to have. As long as you got breath. When you quit, when you quit breathing, you can quit. But as long as you got breath, you praise it. Let everything that has breath praise it. Your dog. I don't know about cats. I don't know what cats do. Uh, my daughter has a bird. All I can think about is if that bird wasn't praising God right now, I'd shoot it. It just goes off in there. She's got a hound dog. She's got a hound dog. And I said, you know what your dog likes, Jill? Air. That's the only thing your dog's good for, sucking air. It's a, what is it? It's a, it's a hound dog. Just a hound dog. And she said, what? why do you mean? Why do you mean my dog just likes air? I said, listen to it. It goes, air, 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 air. I saw it does, air, air. Just wants air. It's only a dog. It's praising him. You got to believe God. That's praise. Amen. Let everything that hath breath. Bull, I don't care if it's a bullfrog. Amen. Let him praise. So, so Scripture teaches that praise and worship involves several things. First, to be physical, lifting up your hands, clapping, dancing. We're not a Pentecostal, charismatic. We're, we're just church. We are the little country church. And in the little country church, biblically, we lift our hands. Amen. We surrender to him. We open our mouths. We use our feet. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. Praise to be vocal, singing, telling God how much you love him, to be emotional. It's okay. I, at times I see people weeping during worship. That's fine. To sincerely express your love for God, to do all this in reverence, to have a sense of awe. He's awe. awe, of course, is to begin awesome. To worship him in awe. Realize just how powerful he is. This is why we should praise him. Praise releases strength. Psalm 28, 6, praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, for I am helped. My heart leaps for joy. I will give thanks to him in song. There's something about praise that brings strength into your life. The more you praise him, the stronger you get spiritually. Learn how to praise him. Let, let him build up strength in you. Second, praise brings victory. Psalm 34, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you, give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in him. How do you describe that? You can see it in people's praise when they delight in him. You see it in the face of a spouse when they delight in the other, a, a parent with a child or grandchild, delight in him. Uh, my dog, Sister Lori, has bought a new carpet. Uh, we have, we have a, a tile floor, so she bought this carpet. And my dog is a, is a cane corso, Italian mastiff. He delights in that new carpet. He gets on his back, and his feet are toward the heavens, and he's doing, the, he's doing that right. He gets in that carpet, and he just digs down inside that carpet. He, lo- he delighting in that carpet. You can tell when, you, you, when something's delight. That's how I feel about God. You just get in here, and you delight in him. Praise invokes the hand of God. When I praise him, I move him. I move him whenever I'm praising him. It, it brings something in, into focus here. Let, let me just tell you, uh, oh, go back. Mike, if you evokes the hand of it was in the book of Acts, chapter 16, that we read Paul and Silas is in jail and they begin to worship God at midnight. And it invoked the hand of God and he cracked the jail open. The jailer is saved, they are rescued all through scripture, whether it be Jehoshaphat, whether it be Joshua marching around the walls. It's something about praise, it invokes the hand, of, it gets God involved in your life. Can I tell you something? If I praise you, I just got you involved in my life. Didn't I? If I praise my kids, I just got them involved in my life. It works that way. Every now and then you need to tell your boss, you're a good boss. <laughs> Young people tell you, but you're a good parent. You're a good mama. You're a good dad. Throw a little praise that way and watch how quick they start helping and doing things for you. I mean, it, it, it just does something. Amen. Praise is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's a powerful thing. Next one. Okay, bro. But the cycle of praise, Psalm 67. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. When the land will yield its harvest, and God our God will bless us, God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Keep rolling. Hosea 6 3. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to not acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. The benefits of praise. Take a little bit of time. 
Amen. Let me just mention it. Just as the water does not evaporate and rain at the same time, amen, it's one's going to take place for the other one. Our praise must first rise to God. It forms clouds of blessing so that and God causes it, them to distill and rain on our lives. So the multitude of blessings from a river of praise, which runs to the ocean of worship, which in turn rises to heaven, and here comes back to blessings again. What I'm saying to you is you can worship here in Crosby, and the blessings of God may travel down and rain on New Caney, and vice versa. But praise always goes up. It's just like evaporation. It goes up and it comes back to us. Amen. We have never lost my praise to him. When I start praising him, things start happening. Now, we talked about two banks here. We got a bank of prayer and a bank of praise. Amen. It flows of the truth of God. The word of God, I believe, is in the middle. In other words, the more we're praying and the more we're praising, the easier it is to preach. It's easier for you to catch the word. Because you're into it. Your heart's open for it. You're ready to catch hold of it. Banks, my friend, banks are important in your life. If, if this church just has praise, then, then and we didn't get no prayer, we're not going to deal with the word good. And I know some churches are just good word churches. Just good word churches. I want all three in our lives. I want us to be a people of prayer. I want us to be a people of praise. And I want us to be a people of the word. Amen. And when you got the banks high, the word's able to move. And what happens, banks hold the truth from escaping. You catch it. Second, banks funnel the truth. Third, if one bank breaks, the levee will have a swamp and stagnant water will form. In other words, if all we do is, is pray and we ain't got no praise or praise and don't have no prayer, it, we, we get a busted bank, we get stagnant. There are times in, in all our lives we've got to maintain prayer, praise, and get the word. We need all of them. That's why I love to praise. I love to start out. You know, Scripture says, come into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Almost all of our songs start upbeat. You notice that? We always try to start them up because that's thanksgiving. And then we go into praise and into worship. It's important to, to realize, okay, I'm going to enter this way, and then I'm going to exit this way here. The higher the banks, the more forceful the truth. It's very important. The more forceful the truth, the cleaner the channel. If you hear the truth enough... The cleaner you become, the more like Christ you become. It starts pushing it away. A river furnishes natural power to run things. My dad worked for Tennessee Valley Authority, retired from there. That's called TVA. They, they had a Colbert steam plant, and they had the dams on, on both sides of that. That Tennessee River furnished all the energy that we need in the Tri-Cities area. Amen. They, it pushed through them dams, and it created energy around them. You know, if you've ever, when we were kids, that's where we took our field trips to Wheeler Dam or Wilson Dam. We'd go down into the turbines, and we'd see that, and they'd explain how the water spins the turbines. The turbines make electricity, electricity stored and then given out. What a smart idea. This is good. You can use it on a small or a large scale. Same way in church. If you want to see energy in church, get them banks high, get the word working, get the people praising and praying, you're going to see some energy in here. Hey, man, people won't be going to sleep at 8.30 on Sunday morning. Or 1030 in New Caney. Come on, that's enough time to be away. A river gets rid of trash. It carries cargo, loads, and uh, you know, burdens up and down to Tennessee. I would see the, the uh, uh, tugboats pushing and, and uh, the barges carrying coal. Well, rivers, you get a river up high enough, it'll carry your burdens out of here. Amen. It'll bless you. So it's important for these things to happen. They start pushing. And rivers feed from above. Amen. We're always here in Joel chapter 2. Verse 28 tells us, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. I'm just going to keep pouring it out on you. We need a river. We need a river. There's something about having it. Ezekiel 47, verse 9. So where the river flows, everything will live. Where the river flows, everything. You ever wonder why some churches are called the river? You go by church, the river of life, uh, the river of this, the river of that. And why do they do that? Because it's, uh, it's biblical. Ezekiel says that where the river is flowing, everything's going to live. Now, let's walk on through this. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Iglam. There will be a place for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. How many realize that in the church, there ought to be many kinds of fish? Jesus taught us to be fishers of men. Fish are correlating with people. So if we see fish... Redfish, blackfish, whitefish, brownfish. Everybody catching the fish here? Everybody see where I'm going here? What's that? Say it again. 
cold fish. Okay. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They'll be left for salt. So you don't want to stagnate. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Fruit trees deal with provision. So what's in the house? People and provision. There are things that you find in the house of God. Connecting with the house brings provision in your life. Where uh, Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Where at? In the church. I called that penicillin. I just wanted you to have three Ps. People, provision, penicillin. Sunday week ago, I was in this pulpit sweating. I started uh, coming down with a fever by uh, Thursday. Had it Friday, Saturday. I don't know if I'm going to make the trip to Florida. I'm, I'm, I know I've got, I, I need to do that. Not, not only that, I know I'm going to get on my motorcycle and ride it to Florida. And I'm breaking out in a cold sweat. If you were here, you saw that. Had it again in second service. But, I, I, but something was breaking in my life. And I asked God, you've got to help me. I, you know, I've got a purpose. I've got a reason this week. You've got to push me on. Now, I'm going to tell you, that I don't always get healed. But when I do, I know it was God. And I've seen people walk one week, two week, three week, four week with flu and dealing with pneumonia. And, and it doesn't make me any more favorable than anybody else. I just say, God, I ain't got time for it. I've got to get well. I need healing. Now, I think if I had time for it, God said, all right, just be sick. <laughs> but I ain't got time for it. So I got on that bike. And before I got to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I was already feeling better. By the next day, I was getting stronger. As a matter of fact, I forgot what it was like to feel bad as I moved through that week. And then, of course, you know, we rode 650 miles on a motorcycle coming home from Florida after helping the church in Panama City that was hit by the Hurricane Michael. Uh, I want to tell you, I just felt like, it was, and I felt because the guys I was with that week, some of them were feeling bad, and I felt for them, man. I felt because God knew God had touched my life. I'm going to tell you, in this house, there are people, there's provision, and there's penicillin. Amen. Keep believing God for your healing. Don't, don't back away from that. And by the way, Learn to, learn to celebrate other people's victory till your victory gets here. You know, so, so, well, Pastor, I got this problem. This person over here got healed, and I ain't healed yet. Celebrate them. Celebrate what happened in their life. Give God thanks for that. Don't let jealousy get up in your life. Thank God. I mean, I used to, when I was a young man, uh, I'd say, Lord, I want children so bad. I, I, I mean, I had, I had teenage girls in my youth group who were pregnant. And that, that one of the girls was going to give us her child. I remember this fixing to happen. She wore a big black shirt so her mom wouldn't even know she was pregnant. It was one of them heartbreaks in life. We thought it was going to happen. Then it didn't happen. She kept the child. But, but it, it's just, I see other people get, and I just started celebrating their children and, and going to their birthday parties and, and not getting mad at God over it. And the next thing I know, I found myself in jail, protesting against abortion and, and believing, and then again in jail, and then again in jail. And then and the next thing I know, I got one child, two child, three. I never was on the list. God just started giving me children. So many, I had to give some of them away. That's a true story. There were certain kids that were given to us. I, had, I gave to other friends of mine. There were two other kids that, that, that are out there because we helped connect them. To others, and because three was plenty. Let me just tell you, I celebrated other people's victory till mine got here. And I continue to do that. And I don't beat myself up when somebody says, Well, it didn't happen for me. I'm sorry. Bless your heart. I just keep celebrating. Just keep celebrating till it gets get you away. Amen. Well, let me keep moving here. Where, where are we at? Oh, what do these people have in common? I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, they're wealthy. That's what they had in common. No, they had more than that in common. What, what did J.C. Penney, Mr. Jacques Penney, Mr. Kraft, the one that started when then, uh, pushing milk and cheese carts on the streets of New York, uh, Mr. Hyde, owner of Mithalatham, Mith, how do you say that word, Mithalatham, Mithil that stuff that smells uh, good. Uh, Mr. Hines, 57 Varieties, uh, Mr. Kerr, the jar company. I know that many don't use jars anymore, but my, I come up with a family that can stuff. They call it canning, but it was actually jarring, <laughs> right? Uh, Hershey's Chocolate, Mr. Jarman, shoe manufacturer, Mr. Kellogg, he had cereal, Mr. Crowell, Quaker Oaks. What did all they have in common? William Colgate. W.M. Baldwin, Pianos, Mr. Converse, the shoes, William Dodge, Mr. Matthias Baldwin, founder of the Baldwin Locomotive Industry, John Rockefeller, financial wizard of the world, 
began tithing. All these men had this in common. They were tithers. They gave 10% of what they had to their church. Began tithing at the age of eight. He said, I have tithed on every dollar that God entrusted to me. And I want to say to you that I could have never tithed on my first million if I had not tithed on my first salary, which was a buck fifty a week. He became one of the richest men in the world, as you know. Whoo. Let's talk about stewardship. Stewardship. Being a good steward. By the way, uh, you, many of you know of Laterno University? Laterno University turns out some of the, the most quality uh, young men and women. He's a maker of them giant earth-moving machines, Laterno. A tither. It's amazing when I started studying and looking at all this stuff. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 12. All Judah brought the tithe of grain, new wine, and oil into the storeroom. Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Your barns will be filled to over. Barns in Scripture deal with storehouse, places where you heap things, overflowing, to fill to satisfaction, to have more than enough. Your vats will brim over with new wine. The vat was a dugout place, the lower place of receiving. New wine dealt with expulsion, something that, that was coming to you. I, I, I have always believed this and have tried to teach you as best I can that financial freedom is what it, is everyone's goal here. Be debt free. No longer owe. To be, to be able to give something to your children and your children's children. They meant to pass some things down. You say, well, pastor, I'm nowhere near I can do that. But isn't that your goal? Isn't that something that you want to do in life? It is for me. Hey, Amen. I, I'll, I'll go see my grandkids as soon as I can, you know, in, I, in their life. It's funny how my kids reacted to my grandkids. As soon as I got a grandson, you know what I did? I bought him a Henry rifle. My kids were going, where was my rifle at when I was born? Couldn't afford it. Amen. But I can afford it now because I got a grandson. And I got that little girl, went and bought her a 22 also. I want my kids to be locked and loaded. Amen. But, but there's something about pouring into them. You just want to be a blessing to them. There are two reasons why I picked on this topic. And listen, first, those, those who are new in the faith, you have to get educated in this practice of tithing. Secondly, towards the conclusions message, I hope to deal with the right way of tithing rather than reasons for tithing. There's, there's a right way to do it, not just the reasons. But when I got born again, I was taught this, and I, I, really, I didn't fight it. I, I found that, I, for me, I just wanted to be obedient. So 30-something years ago, I started becoming a tither. Long before I started pastoring or preaching, I started giving to, to the storehouse or to the church I went to because I believed that was right. And at that time, I was a burger flipper for Sonic. Then I, got, then I got, went to RC, and I blamed God for RC Cola because I, I was one out of like, a, I don't know, 90, 100 guys that, that went to apply. Six of us were to get the job, and I was one of them. I got, I got a job in a very beat down area but I remember joining hands with my friends and praying because I read the scripture you just read the scripture and it just jump all over you I read the scripture if any two of you agree on, uh, on any one thing is touching that my father in heaven will hear and do it and I, I agreed we agreed in Jesus name I would get the job at RC Cola and when the phone phone call came in I wasn't shocked I believed I'd get that job oh I worked hard Stacking drinks, hauling in drinks. I just needed a job. I just need, and every time that I, I was blessed with a paycheck, I, I cut that ten percent out, and I made sure that God got it. Uh, there were lean times in my life. My first home, while I was working for RC Cola, I paid twenty seven hundred dollars for it. I could watch the dogs playing under the trailer while I took a shower. They run right up there. There's a, there's a tub. The marlots warped, and I could watch the dogs running in and out under the shower while I'm showering. I'm a tither. I'm blessed. I got a $2,700 trailer living on the side of Hawk Pride Mountain. I, I remember not having enough money to put into my car to make it through my work week and find a check in the mail. I've seen God do crazy things in my life I, over and over again. I, I, we played Rook to help disciple a young people, and we just used this game of Rook. It was a fun game to play. I lost a green 12 in the Rook deck. If you lose a green anything, if you lose a, a card, it, 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 it nullifies the whole deck. I'm at RC Cola, and I'm flipping cartons over. At that time, drinks came in cartons, and I'm flipping, dumping them out of the, the wooden crates. And when I do, a, red, a, a, a green 12. Only card in the whole place pops up, floats around like this, falls to the ground. I took it, put it in the deck. It matches the deck of cards I got. 
uh, well, you say, why you say that? Because God is concerned about the little things in my life. You say, you blame that on tithing? I, I won't take it away from tithing or prayer or praise or being faithful. God did things that over and over again. Had somebody break into my house while I was at work. Thieves, I hate thieves. I wore one once. I hate thieves now. I do. Broke in, stole my camera, stole my class ring. You know, just a few little knickknacks I had, but it just bothered me that it was stolen. A couple years later, uh, my mom calls me up. I'll take it back. Under the Christmas tree was a little package for me. And I looked and opened up the package, and there was my class ring in the package. My mom said, there was a little boy playing over in the next town in Florence, Alabama. Well, you'll ring a teacher, saw it, looked at it, saw your name in it, called the high school, got hold of me, and now you got your ring back. I find that God finds a way to get things back to you over and over. I have stories like this over and over again. And all I can tell you is that if you're faithful, if you're just faithful in the small things, and to me, tithing is a small thing. It's just giving of that which God gave me. Giving back to him, it begins to change things. Stewardship, my friend, is acknowledging God is the owner of all things. He owns everything. We're simply stewards. I don't care how wealthy you are, you're not taking it with you when you go. Amen. The only way I can do it is send it ahead. But what we do here matters there. So I send it ahead. Where moth and rust can't corrupt it. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So the act of claiming ownership over someone else's property is known as robbing. I can't rob God. I can't act like this is mine. Yes, I, I have a house. Yes, I technically own it. But actually, I'm just stewarding that brick house until I'm gone. Even I don't get to keep it. But thank God I'm debt free. Come on, amen? It's a good thing. Uh, when I don't, when I don't tithe, I rob God of the ownership that is rightfully his. Malachi 3.8 tells us, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. How did you do it? With tithe and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, and there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now here, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you, there shall not be room enough for you to receive. So in tithing, I support those who serve in God's house. In the Old Testament, the tithe served in threefold purpose. Sacrificial purposes, domestic needs of the Levites, and for whatever emergencies they faced. My tithe helps to improve the ministry of this local church. That's what it does. It supports not only the pastors and the workers here, but also our um, missionaries and for emergencies that come up. It's a key to a blessing, to the kingdom blessing. In tithing, I operate a spiritual law, which works like the law of gravity. It has to work. Everybody say, it has to work. work. Say it again, it has to work. work. Look, I don't tithe in order to get back. That ain't why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I'm doing it to honor him. But God will bless it. He always has blessed the tithe. I know people that don't go to church anymore that still sends their tithe to our church. They will not stop. they they mad at uh, maybe things in the church or people or me or whatever. But they keep sending money to the church. You know why? Because that is a principle they believe in. And they're going to keep on tithing. They don't back away. And now in this day of where you can give it through your phone. And here at this church, we, we figured out that you can give it to your phone, you can give it to your app. A lot of our finances are now coming in through online. It doesn't come through, you know, and if it was up to me, I'd say, yeah, everybody's going to give cash or check or something. I just got to feel it. But it's, it's not up to me. It's this new day, a new way. And my kids already, I mean, I give Joseph, and, and, and I, I remember a couple years ago, I found Joseph's check in a deer stand. Oh, I picked that check up. I put it in my pocket. I thought, I got that boy. Man, he's unappreciative. You know, I pay him. He's not appreciating what I give him. And so uh, we get in the car, truck heading back here to, to, uh, to uh, New Caney. We were coming out of South Texas. And I looked at him and said, did you lose anything today? No, I ain't lost nothing. I'm thinking, how you know when you ain't lost a week's paycheck? I ain't lost nothing. Ain't, no. I said, how about this? And I pulled that check out like that. He said, Pastor. I already put that in the bank. I said, you what? It's in my hand. He said, I already put it in the bank. He said, I took a picture of it on my phone and sent it to the bank. You what? (laughs) He said, that check (coughs) is void and null. It ain't no good no more. That money's already in the bank. You kidding me? No, it's right here in my hand. No, it's in the bank. (laughs) So this is what I deal with now. 
All of my staff, my sons, uh, that's just how they do it. The, the girls, they, they all do it this way. So I understood. Just shut up, give in. Tell folks, you want to give online? Bless the Lord online. You want to tithe online? Bless the Lord. You want it to come out of your paycheck? Bless the Lord. Well, however you want to do it, just make sure that you do it. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. My tithe does help. It's a key to kingdom blessing. In tithe, and I operate that spiritual law, which works like, again, the law of gravity. Reality is that we should. Listen, stop praying for the tithe and the offering. God's going to bless your tithe. For me, I, 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 I've just started. I don't beat you up. I've seen people get beat up. I don't want that to happen. I want you out of a free spirit, free willing, understand that this is a principle. Just start doing it. And watch this. If you do the book, you get the blessing. That's the way it is. The, the tithe activates security. Malachi 3.11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. And the nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord. There's something about tithing. It triggers supernatural provision and protection over my earnings. Again, I, I may have 100%, and I give 10%. God blesses the 90 and made it more than what the 100 was. It's supernatural. I don't know how he does it. I don't have to know how. He heals me, saves me, rescues me, and blesses me financially. But he does it over and over again. The right way to tithe, treat it with respect. Treat your tithing with, look, you earned that money. God gave you the gifts and talents to earn it. You earned it. Treat it with respect. Set apart the 10% before you do anything else with the money you got. You know, learn how to do that. You know, I, I won't use the tithe in time of need. And then I'll, I'll pay it later. I meet people that way. I, I just got to tithe. I just got to give it to God. Bring the whole tithe. The word tithe literally means 10%. And well, you, you listen, I don't care who you are. 10% is just 10%. It, if you make a million dollars, there's 10%. If you make a thousand, it's 10%. If you make a hundred, it's 10%. God didn't say, I'm, you know, in other words, it just levels the playing field. I wish our tax system was 9%. Yeah, nice. yeah under whatever God asked for. Amen. That our government should never ask for more than what God does. And it's nine, flat nine. Everybody got the flat nine. I think everybody would be good with that. I would. Amen. I'd be real good with that. It, you know, so if you're tithing from, from your crops, you offer the best unto God, not, not what is left behind. The church is God's only authorized storehouse. So given any other ministry, I, and I, there are ministries all the time asking for your tithe. If you do that, Look, the only, let me be honest, the only authorized storehouse is the house of God. Everything else gets an offering. I'll just, I'll give you an offering. I'll bless you with an offering. But my tithe comes here to the house. Let me get, tell you about three unhealthy attitudes. Tithing out of obligation. That's the wrong attitude. Well, I'm just obligated. Don't, don't feel obligated. I'd rather you not do that. If you love him and you trust him, then you honor him. That's the right attitude. Remember, Abraham tithed out of a free will long before God even commanded tithing. What did you say, Pastor? Long before it was ever demanded of the people to tithe, Abraham tithed. He just believed in it. He believed to give that 10%. Uh, limiting God is, is, very, is, is the wrong attitude. You know, all I have is God's not just the 10%. When I give the 10%, God blesses the 90 So it's not like saying that, you know, look, that 90 is still God's. It's all his. Amen. And conditional tithing. You know, when I tithe, God will meet my needs. God is not obligated to do, however. I don't tithe to meet a need, but I obey God and I honor him. I have often said this from this pulpit, that if you tithe for three months and you feel like that God lied to you, we'll give you a tithe back. Because we keep up with it. We'll write you a check, hand it back to you, and we'll write on the check for God lied. And we'll hand it to you. If you can prove you have been tithing correctly for three months. I've been saying this for 25 years. Not one time has somebody come up to me and said, give me my check. Because everybody I know that's been a tither, God has blessed them. And, and they've honored God with what they've done. So you start today. Tithing is a spiritual discipline. I must develop. Now listen to me. Do it consistently. Do it systematically. And if you neglect and pay tithe in the past... You know, I, I have, Pastor, you don't understand. I got 20 years of back God support. <laughs> Did y'all catch that? 
20 years of back God support. What am I going to do? I should have been paying God 20 years ago, and I, I should have been giving my tithe 20 years ago, and I ain't done. I got back God support. What did I do? Well, here's what I do. I realize that God forgives. I let go of that so you're not under bondage and start today. Amen. Just start today. If you were under the Old Testament law, you'd be paying a penalty tax. Amen. I would start today. Say, God, just help me today to work this thing out for your glory. Can I get an amen? amen. How many of you that, that you could just say, uh, you know, I've been a tither and I can tell you that it works. It works. It just works. Amen. Not only that, I feel like I, I contributed. I helped. You know, uh, I, my, my lifestyle is about the middle of this church. Wherever the middle, uh, and not over yet, not about, I, I drive a regular pickup truck. I, uh, I, I live in a standard home, you know, but I have lived in trailers. I have driven the worst of the vehicles to go preach the gospel. I've been to the bottom, and this is as high as I've ever been, and I feel good about it. Amen. I mean, I like, I've lived in a cabin when I had to. I've lived in an RV when I had to. And now I'm finally back into my home. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. For those of you that are in a home, God love you. It feels good. It feels good to be back there. He's the God of first things. If you give God the tithe again, you activate the blessing in your life. Which do you want? I gave God less and I can't find what I saved. Or I gave God his and I don't know where the extra came from. I'll take where the extra came from. And it's a matter of honor. Probably the best part of tithing is honor. Just honor. Uh, there, there are times when people do something for me, it's just because they want to honor me. As a, as a parent, when my, one of my kids, um, my son won't say much. He don't like to be here. You know that. He doesn't like to be around crowds. But he showed up this morning to face his Goliath. It blessed me. It honored me. You know what really honored me? When I called him at 7 o'clock and he was already gone. <laughs> and he called me back. He said, Dad, I'm already on. I'm almost, I'm almost there. That honored me. There's something about that. The scripture says, honor your mother and father, and you'll live long on the earth. That word honor, to honor parents, is about their position. It's not always about their personality. It's about position. Honoring a police officer, honoring uh, the president, the leaders over us, honor. Honor is to honor one another. When I tithe, I'm telling God, I honor you. I honor you. I thank you for what you've done. I, I remember, Miss Diane, you talking to me about Something I said years ago that Jesus was heaven's tithe. When God gave Jesus, he was the first begotten. He was, he was the first one from the dead. He was the, the resurrected. When Jesus literally, if you look at Scripture correctly, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being a curse for us. The word tithe is the Hebrew word karam, which is a curse. It's a, weird, it's a weird dichotomy. When they went into Jericho, God said, y'all can have all the promised land, but Jericho's mine. Don't touch it. In other words, everything in that city is devoted back to the storehouse. It's devoted to God. Achan goes in, and he takes some gold wedges and some jackets, and he hides them in his tent. Then Israel goes out and fights against Ai, and 36 men die. Joshua rents his clothes stands before God and said, what, what's the problem? And God said, you robbed me. He said, excuse me? He said, you robbed me. He said, how did we do that? He said, just check you guys out. And they went to Ai, and he confessed that he stole some gold in a jacket. He said, it wouldn't. I mean, it's just gold in a jacket. But you don't understand, to honor God, this first fruit is God's. This, this Jericho of the promised land is God. You can have the rest, but this here belongs to God. Because of that, 36 sons died, 36 uncles, 36 fathers, 36 men are dead. And now Ai is going to die. The Scripture says they stoned him, his wife, his children, and his animals to prove a point to everybody. You know, I will never preach tithing to the point that I'd want to stone anyone or beat anyone up. I don't think God's in that place today as far as that. He wants you to do it voluntarily. But understand, it matters. It matters. And so when Christ became a curse for us, he became the carom of heaven. He became the tithe of heaven. And Isaiah tells us this. I'll give you the scripture. Isaiah 53, uh, verse, verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crucify him and cause him to suffer. 
And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. So Christ became an offering. He became a tithe for us. And God used that to do what? Bring forth many sons. So that tithe of heaven gave God millions of children. It's amazing, isn't it? So God ain't asking us to do something he won't do himself. Hmm. Any questions? Come on. Any questions? Anybody want to repent? <laughs> Come on, anybody? No, 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 I mean any questions now, not repent. You're kidding me. You got to have, you got to have more questions. Anything? Because we done a little bit early. Is it okay? Everybody good with that? Anybody ready to quit the church? Huh? Hey, man, ministry, ministry is a, a you got to give it a grip. You got to get a hold of this. I think there's a teaching in your, in your book there, but use your manual. Learn how to walk through it. There's a lot of good stuff in there, things that, you know, again, I'm not going to grade you on it. You're just kind of hunting through the Scripture and trying to find things. But ministry, the motivation for ministry is love, and that we love one another. And as long as we do that, our church will be strong. We keep covering one another, caring for one another. Be careful. If, please catch the things that we say. Be careful with your, your tongue, what you say to others, how you say it. Sometimes it ain't what you say. It's how you say it. Amen. Be careful of that. Amen. Uh, are we ready in the back or we know? To those watching online, thanks for tuning in. If you get opportunity to come here right now, we'll feed you some lasagna. How about that? If not, I'll see you tomorrow in church or back online. Thanks for tuning in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all give them watching a hand before they go out of here. Amen. Any other questions? I'm saying other because y'all ain't asked one yet. I have